everyone. Welcome to our second session of the day for the Siouxland Garden Show. Uh, we're so excited to have everyone joining us today. Um, my name is Caitlin and I have Carol Larvik with me today. Um, I'm with Iowa State University Extension Outreach and Carol's with Nebraska Extension. Um, so quick, we're going to go through our little welcome PowerPoint and then we'll bring Steve up um, onto camera and we'll get to his PowerPoint. All right, so just a reminder to go ahead and join us in the comments. Um, so if you guys are joining us on Facebook Live, that's gonna be the easiest way for you guys to type comments through us or throughout the sessions. Um, so if you have any questions for Steve throughout his presentations, feel free to drop those in the comments. Uh, just to start out, we'd love to know where you guys are joining us from. Um, and if you're a master gardener, uh, we've been so lucky to kind of bring in speakers from all over the country. Steve's actually with Oregon Extension. so. Uh, we're excited to have him. So if you're joining us from all over, let us know. And then just a reminder, that's the best place um, for any questions throughout. If you guys are watching on the website, but do have a Facebook page, feel free to go over to the Facebook tab at the top of the page, and that will take you directly to our Facebook if you would prefer to um, have access to the comments. Of course, this is week three of our Siouxland Garden Show. We have three more weeks after this, um, so make sure to join us for those. Next week, we're going to be talking about gardening for the long game. Um, and then also a little bit about container vegetable gardening. So we have Aaron joining us from Penn State and then Cindy joining us um, from Iowa State University Extension Outreach. So make sure to join us for all of our sessions. All the information is on the Siouxland Garden Show website page as well as our Facebook page. So um, feel free to check those out. If you go over to the speakers tab is where you can uh, learn more about our speakers as well as those um, topics. And like I said at the beginning, Carol and I are both with two different extension offices. I'm with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach in Woodbury County. And Carol is with Nebraska Extension Dakota County. So this is actually a collaborative effort, the Siouxland Garden Show is. Uh, between those two extension offices to put on all these awesome garden series as well as our in-person show um, that we've had in the past. So we have a great committee that's made up of, of extension professionals as well as master gardeners. So we have Carrie King, Carol Larvik, Molly Hewitt, myself, Caitlin Brinkerhoff, we have Kevin Potabom, Emily Yaki, and then the bottom three are master gardeners that join us um, on the committee. So we have Rex Towns, Randy Burnight, and Diana Kincaid. So this committee has worked really hard um, at scheduling out all of our in-person garden shows, as well as the quick switch that we have to make um, for the Siouxland Garden Show. So in 2020, we had about two weeks to put together the virtual session. Um, and for 2021, we did decide to go virtual in about September. So we had a little bit more time to plan, which was awesome for us. <laughs> um, so it's a great committee and it's been so fun to work with everyone. And we are really uh, looking forward to being back in person in 2022. So we wanna make sure that you guys go ahead and save the dates for those. So it's gonna be Friday, April 2nd and Saturday, April 3rd at the Marriott Center in South Sioux City. So this is uh, two days for you guys to come out. Uh, still have educational sessions. We have a winter's farmer's market um, as well as local garden vendors and a children's play area. So all kinds of fun stuff. And of course we have our master gardeners there to help you with questions throughout the uh, two days. Um, admission into the two days is $5, um, and all of our virtual sessions are free, so we're so excited to be having people join us. So I know for a lot of folks, this is their first time with the Siouxland Garden Show, so definitely jump into the comments. Let us know if this is the first time uh, you're joining us for a Siouxland Garden Show, whether it be virtual, anything like that, or um, if you've been joining us in the past, we'd love to know how long you've been with us. And a big thank you to our volunteers and vendors. Um, we have about over 70, master, over 70 Master Gardener volunteers that help us put on the Siouxland Garden Show every year. Um, and they've been great to work with and they're the ones that are always running around with the uh, colored shirts um, and providing all kinds of education. So we're so sad that we can't be with everyone this year, but we're so excited that we were still able to provide you guys with some education and all kinds of fun gardening information for this year, just with the virtual show. And for our vendors, we've had over 40 vendors every year. Um, and so we are just so excited to be back in person next year um, and have you guys back out. And a big thank you to our sponsors. Um, 
none of that would be possible without you guys. Um, our sponsors for each session are gonna be up in the left-hand corner. If you wanna learn more about any of our sponsors uh, throughout the sessions, you can always visit our website uh, to learn a little bit more about them. All right, so we are going to go ahead and get Steve up onto screen and he's gonna be talking a little bit about winter care of apples and cherry trees. Hi, Steve. Yeah, hello. This is, this is Carol from Nebraska Extension, and we are so excited to have you today working uh, about telling us about more about apple trees and cherry trees. Mm -hmm. Our community orchard here in South Sioux City started several years ago, and none of us were really very good about knowing much about uh, trees and the caring for them, and we've learned by some hard knocks. We're excited today to actually find out some more information and to do a little bit better with our trees. It looks like your PowerPoint's coming up. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep, Pleasure. the stage is all yours, Steve. Okay. Well, you might think uh, that I, being from uh, Oregon presently, that uh, I might not know very much about the Midwestern climate, but in fact, I grew up in Minnesota. And uh, I'm quite aware of the weather conditions that you folks have. And so uh, just kind of feel comfortable that I'm able to give this presentation knowing that, that you do have weather extremes that we don't in the West. But uh, I'll, I'll make sure to make a point here and there if I, if I think that my presentation might not be bringing enough of that out. So let's go ahead. And next. So the topics we'll be discussing today for both apple and cherry are, are pruning. And I've, I've decided to add just a little bit more to the presentation because when we talk about pruning, you'll notice that there's some really sound basics to cover, but you really can't get into a whole lot of detail online. It's kind of hard to really explain uh, all of that. But after you've done your pruning, it's very critical to have a nice fruit crop. You're going to have to follow through with a little thinning and a little pest control. Now, part of that pest control is your dormant season. And the thinning is in the very early season. So, so we'll, we'll touch base with all of these things. And you'll see how, they're all, how they all run together and they're all pertinent for today. Go ahead. So the pruning and training, I always call this the first step to quality fruit. Uh, next. The, the first thing you need to learn to do is to have good equipment. If you're going to be training and pruning these fruit trees, these fruit trees can last for decades. And if you don't have good equipment, typically you're not doing a very a good job of pruning and you're also uh, making poor pruning where you're leaving a lot of wounds around. And so th the idea is to have an assortment because you're going to have to do different things with different parts of the tree. Now, you, uh, big loppers is important if you're removing the larger limbs. Uh, I like the kind of the mid-size, the orange handled uh, pruner there. I like that size when I'm really, when the trees are either quite young or when the trees are really established and their overall form is there. So you're really pruning mostly on one-year-old wood after, after the establishment of the form. The other things, you can see there's a little green thing sitting there in the middle. Well, that's one of the sharpeners. And every time you prune, you need to make sure your tools are very sharp. The other a little handsaw and then the, there's a hand pruners, a secateur, and on the right is something that a lot of homeowners still haven't discovered, I've noticed, and that's one of the extension pruners that uh, allows you to reach branches uh, at least about four or five feet away, six feet away, and they have another version where it's actually about a, a seven or eight foot extension, and it's not 
like the old pull the string type. This, this one has a nice strong mechanism with it. So you might look for that in your garden store the next time you're around if you're getting tired of climbing up on ladders. Next. So having the right tools, you, like I was saying, the loppers, you want one with about a two foot handle and a large head because that's the size that you're gonna need to be able to cut a branch that, that is at least that two inch in diameter. Any, any larger than the two inch diameter branch, you're probably gonna use the little handsaw. So the short loppers, you know, the one foot handles, those, those are your all around season uh, tool. And then again, the handsaw, the small pruners, the extended hand uh, handle pruners, and then that sharpening tool, very critical. And you can find those sharpening tools that, at any of the national uh, box stores, for example, Home Depot or Lowe's, they'll, they'll carry all of those. Next. So why are we pruning? So most people, when you stop them, uh, before they even go into the vineyard or into the orchard, I usually say to the master gardeners that I train, I said, so why are you pruning today? And for the most part, they answer me because it's winter. When, when in fact, that's really, you know, not the best answer. You're, you're pruning because there, you need to remove some of the wood, but you need to do it in a very balanced way. So I've often, when I teach classes on pruning, I talk about balanced pruning. And that balanced pruning is combined with a good thinned tree. When you get out and you thin the crop load, you know, that will equal an annual flowering and good fruiting. If you're not doing balanced pruning and thinning the crop load, you're going to have that biennial flowering, biennial fruit set. And you really won't get a nice uniform spread across the tree either. So if you think about the other option, if you get out there and you're one of those people that just loves to whack the daylights out of your fruit tree, uh, heavy pruning plus will lead to, of course, a light crop load. But that also then equals a very vigorous tree that's unfruitful. And then it has a few little fruit that set on it that get rather large as the season goes on. But you can see that if you jump in there and you do this heavy prune every year, heavy prune, what's the response of the tree? Well, the response of the tree is to produce more growth, more vegetative growth, and not very much fruit. So those fruit buds are not being formed. You're, you're knocking most of them off the tree. So the other extreme here is when you do no pruning and you're, you're talking about a heavy crop load. Often you get a lot of uh, weak trees, a weak growth, but also breaking limbs from the heavy crop load, and then small fruit. So really think about these three things that I've talked about here, these bullet points. The balanced pruning is where you've got a really nice amount of wood that's coming out of there, and you're thinning the crop load, so you're getting really good annual flowering. Your trees will, will bloom every year and set good fruit every year. Next. So we have two methods of pruning when you're focusing on a fruit tree. And, and I guess you could even say this is true with uh, shade trees and ornamental trees too, but it really is focusing for fruit trees because if you're doing a heading back cut, so you're one of those people that just loves to keep your tree small. So you're just doing, you're tipping almost everything. You're tipping every branch. You're cutting back on the big leaders. It, it tends to invigorate the tree. So what does that do? It causes a lot of lateral buds to break and you're shooting out lots more side branches. So, so what is the uh, overall pattern of growth with the tree? it's getting thicker and thicker, heavier and heavier, denser and denser. You're not getting light into most of the canopy with this type of a tree. If you were pruning this style on your fruit tree every year, you're really gonna get poor quality fruit. 
So what's a better method with fruit trees? Typically thinning out cuts. So when you have to make a thinning cut, you're not just tipping off part of the branch. You're looking at that branch and you're trying to decide, should I leave that branch in its entirety or should I take it out? And you go and you follow that branch back to where it comes off of the, either the trunk or the, the side branch and you follow it back to where the branch collar is and you remove it. And so you're removing a whole branch rather than just cutting half of a branch. And it doesn't matter if it's a one-year shoot, a two-year shoot, three-year shoot, it's become a, a, a nice side branch. Don't cut them back, just part way. You're either gonna thin them out or not. So thinning cuts stimulate the apical growth that uh, happens at the end of branches and at end from the main trunk. So you'll get nice new apical shoots coming out that are that are in control. What is an apical shoot? Well, the apical shoot is one that, that really is being controlled by the dominant bud at the end of that shoot. So, so shoot elongation occurs rather than sprouting new side shoots. So it, it's a way thinning cuts reduce the branch numbers. Okay, next. <clears throat> so a few pruning tips while you're working. So annual training, I always don't go out there and, and work every year. Do this project with your trees every year. Don't go out one year and then say the next year, oh man, that was a lot of work. I think I'll skip a year in between. So annual training uh, reduces those big cuts. If you go out and you do that pruning or training of a new tree, you do that every year, you generally aren't going to have to make very many big cuts. So during the first three to four years of the, tr um, the tree's life in the ground, the tree has the priority over the crop. So kind of remember this. You're training the form of that tree you're not really out there to worry about crop production yet. And most dwarf trees, if you're getting a semi-dwarf tree or a dwarf tree, they can start producing fruit in that second, third, fourth year. So remember, if they start setting to uh, very much fruit, you're gonna actually cut that fruit off. And the other thing you're gonna do is you're gonna keep vertical branches to a minimum. You want, you maybe want a, a leader on the tree, but you don't want very many other vertical branches other than the leader of the tree. So keep them to a minimum. And any time you're out there with your pruning shears, if you see suckers or sprouts or diseased wood, anytime you take it out, no matter what time of the year it is. And especially in the winter time, if you're out there with your tools, make sure you're cleaning up a lot of the suckers and sprouts. If you find that your tree is, you're cutting those suckers or sprouts every year and it just keeps shooting up more, it's actually a, a good little practice to go out and cut suckers and make sure you're cutting them pretty close to smooth cuts, right up as close as you can to the roots or to the trunk. But it's a good practice to get out there and do that in the summertime. And why? Because the summer pruning is devigorating different than winter pruning, which is invigorating. So sometimes cutting those suckers out, if they've gotten very significant and you cut them out, they might try to come back again uh, when you're doing winter pruning. But often if you're starting and you see those little sprouts or suckers, when they're still pretty young, you go ahead and cut those. Most of the time you're gonna be able to control those. <clears throat> and the other thing to kind of keep in mind when you've trained this tree, have an idea of the mature height that you want that tree to be. And then you're going to make that height a constant. You don't want to have to be allowing that tree to grow to 15 feet tall and then cut it back to 10 feet tall. That's very hard on the fruit trees. So make sure that's uh, something you do and you monitor when, you start, when your tree is starting to get close to that mature height. And then on the bottom there, one of the keys is keep trees open for good light penetration. 
Good light penetration equals less disease and better pest control. Okay, next. So with uh, the other thought here is pruning the pruning targets. What should your pruning targets be? And when I'm talking about this, I'm kind of referring to the percent of the removal of one year wood. So if you've got uh, a small young tree that's one, two, three years old, obviously you're gonna thin out a little bit of some of those shoots, but for the most part, you're not removing very much wood at all. But with mature trees, they need a lot of thinning cuts. They're constantly trying to add a lot of wood that really will block that light. So once the tree is established, once you've got the form you like and it's established, just remember that you often will remove upwards of 80% and sometimes even up to 90% of the one year wood, of that new growth wood that occurred in the previous year. Now, if you've got the really good form out there, you can see why that makes sense because you've established that structure and apple and pear trees produce, produce their fruit on spurs. So there, so you really don't need a lot of new wood. The only time you would need new wood is if you maybe need to replace a diseased limb, a broken limb, something that uh, really has maybe a limb that just was didn't look very good and wasn't uh, structurally or in the right place. So for the most part, when your trees are established, you know, you, you can thin out most of that one year wood. So now with cherries, cherries, when you're pruning them, will have a lot more heading cuts. Remember back to a couple of slides and we talked to about thinning cuts versus heading cuts. And the reason that cherries should have a lot more heading cuts is that you want to keep refreshing and keeping keep getting a lot of new fruiting wood a lot of flowering wood and the only way you're going to get that is to keep tipping you got to tip a lot of these side branches tip a lot of the upper branches and and the thing that's so different than apple and pear is that a cherry tree as it gets older will gradually move all the fruiting zone of that tree higher and higher and higher. And what will happen is that you'll find yourself, you know, four or five years later, that the fruiting zone in that cherry tree, as it's matured, is now five, six feet, seven feet above the ground. And you're not getting much on those older limbs down below. Why? Well, partly because they're getting shaded. But another reason is the fact that you have not allowed new growth to occur, you know? And the only way you get new growth on uh, most of these fruit tree limbs is you've gotta be tipping the shoots, the new shoots that are coming up, you tip them and you'll get side shoots developing. And those side shoots on an annual basis, they'll keep making new flowers and new fruit. So next. So if you have, uh, if you're out there now, you're going out into your backyard, like this is a picture of my backyard. And if you're going out there and you're looking at your, your yard and you're saying, well, now it's time to train something here. I got these trees coming up. What, how do I do that? Well, if you look at this tree, for example, you can see that a number of things are going on. One, one is, I like to train, uh, and we'll see some other shoot shots here also, but I like to train what we call a central leader. And you, you look at this tree and you see there's limbs coming off to the sides and in all directions, three, four, five limbs. And then you go up, you go up about two feet and you got the same thing, maybe another three or four uh, limbs that are coming off to the side. And then you go up again, you decide the height that you're willing to work. This, this tree now is about probably about nine feet tall. And, and that's about the height I like to work with when I'm working in my orchard. And so now I'm up here toward the top 
And, and this coming year, this will probably be about the last uh, kind of whirl of branches that I allow on this tree. But the point here is that, that I wanted to show you is that you have to use a number of different methods in order to get this tree to form properly and to be trained properly. You've got to use these little wood spreaders or something similar to to make a little V notch in the ends of these wood branch or these wood spreaders and then stick them out to the branch and then you keep forcing these branches down outward and down. You want these branches to form about somewhere around a 45 degree angle coming off the main leader. And if in fact you're having trouble with the spreaders, you can you might not know what this is, but this is a line, a string, uh, a heavy duty twine that's wrapped around a branch and, and we just pull it down and then I staple it. I put these uh, yard staples in, just pound them into the ground or a, or a little metal post or stake and and then leave those on there for about a year. Sometimes you might even need it for a second year, but they your branches eventually then at this age where they're about four, five years old, you're gonna start getting some fruit on there and then the fruit becomes the weight that holds them down. But initially when you're training, you really need to do use the spreaders and to use uh, twine or whatever to tie them down. But here again, the form is what we call the central leader and some people say modified central leader. Okay, next. Uh, here, here's a couple other shots. Uh, these are from uh, a commercial orchard that's in our area. And you can see that in the orchard, you have the same activity going on. This, this person had uh, used a big metal post or stake and they trained this tree. And, and here's that whirl of branches that's going around three, four, five branches, depending on the, uh, your, interest and then you go up that foot and a half or so and train another level so so how do you train these well in general when these trees are young uh, a lot of people say well to get a central leader you guess you would just leave that let that tree grow you know un, unabated and and you you could and it would reach this height but what would happen is you wouldn't have your your uh, each level of new side branches developing properly. So the better way to do it is actually you top that tree. So you've got a one year, uh, you go one year here, the tree's probably first, second year of growth, and then you cut the top off. And then in the dormant season, as dormancy breaks into the next season, there'll be a bud that will just shoot and you will train it to go upright again. And then you'll tip it again at the end of that season. And so this tree took, if you see one, two, three, four, five uh, branching levels, it took five years to train. And so what is, what's the, the beauty of this form? Well, the beauty of the central leader form for anybody that wants to grow fruit is that rather than that old fashioned old open center vase, this system right here, you can see it has light uh, penetrating the canopy from all sides at all levels. And with old trees, and I've got a few shots coming up, you'll see this, but with old trees, you just get too much interior shade. So upwards of 40% of the fruit on an old tree that's open center vase often has poor quality and poor color. So the idea with these commercial orchards now, just about everybody's growing some sort of a form. If it's not the central leader, it's a modified central leader that's even a smaller tree, but very upright. So the beauty of this system, I always kind of remind our master gardeners that the beauty of this system when it's done right is you can see light through the canopy and People ask, uh, the master gardeners will ask me, well, how much light? And I say, well, you know, if a bird 
can fly through here in a few places and actually flutter through. They might not actually have to land, but just kind of flutter right through. That's about right. You want a little space. So, so you can definitely get air movement as well as the light. And what are we doing with that air movement? We're preventing a lot of disease potentially. So next. So here's the old fruit tree in the old orchards that um, when I was a, a new extension agent, I worked at Cornell University and uh, in the Finger Lakes district. And a lot of the fruit trees were like this. They were big old fruit trees, you know, really huge. They have a big apple processing industry in that area and juice industry. And so they would uh, mechanically harvest a lot of apples even. But so what's the problem with these old trees? Well, number one is as we, the, the owners of these trees get older, you know, we don't, we don't want to be up on ladders at 15 feet in the air or, or higher. And the other problem is, like I mentioned, all of this area down here, the lower third of that tree is really in a dark zone and a real poor zone for producing good quality fruit. Your best fruit on these trees is going to be way up here. And so two problems that I can see, well, three actually, you don't want to be up there pruning and you really don't want to be up there with a backpack sprayer on trying to spray on a tree this big. And then the third thing is think about harvesting. You, you literally would be up in a point where, where it'd be pretty dangerous. So next. So if you have an old tree like that, uh, basically, what can you do with it? A lot of people will ask me these questions. Well, I've got this old fruit tree and it seems like it's a neat old variety. You know, what can I do to maybe make it healthier or productive? And so number one, you get into the trees and of course you cut out anything that's dead or infected. And what I also encourage them to do is to start a renovation project. So uh, usually over the course of about three years, you could drop a tree like that last one. You can drop the height of that tree by about a foot or more a year. So, so really reducing the height of a 15 foot tree to a 12 foot tree, uh, a 20 foot tree to a 15 over a three year program, that, that's pretty reasonable. And so you don't wanna do it in one year. And why is that? Well, that's a pretty dramatic shock to the uh, plant. But also, like I say here down on some of the other bullet points, you really don't want to be cutting any of the limbs that are larger than about three or four inches in diameter. Because, of course, those open wounds are not going to heal properly. They're not going to callus very well. And so you'd be committed to having to spray some fungicides like copper on those pruning wounds for years to come to try to keep those from rotting. So another thing to kind of think about is if you have that old tree, you do need to make sure you're getting rid of any of the limbs that have kind of filled in over time in that center. So if you have that form, you do have to remember the only way you're getting quality fruit is to open up the centers. Yeah, next. So here's a, an older tree that uh, somebody decided they were going to renovate. And think about that last photo a little. That tree was probably up uh, as high as these uh, smaller branches. Now, this tree was coming out of a winter uh, pruning that had gone over about three years. But you can see they left a fair amount of growth on these outward limbs. Initially, when you're taking the height out of the tree, you do have to allow the tree to compensate and make a little bit of side growth. So that, that's really helpful to do that. So, so this gives you an idea. Now your first step would be in, the, in this winter where you're going in where the tree is in front of me. I would go in here and I would reduce the length of these side branches now. And now I would start to get these back down. So you're just making a, a one or two year wood cut and that's not too dramatic. And the tree is not gonna feel quite so much shock. Next. So 
a lot of people have uh, in our area commercially have gone to high intensity orchards and Washington, especially, uh, but also here in Oregon, even California, uh, this is pretty common for just about all the tree fruit. And well, what, what are the advantages? Obvious advantages are even if you're a homeowner and all you want to do is plant four or five of these in a row and build a little trellis like this, the advantages are that fruit's always going to be easy to pick, easy to spray, the tree's easy to work with and prune. So, so this is an option. If you do want to do something like this, you have to make sure that you're getting a, a true dwarfing rootstock, a full dwarf rootstock. And it's a little difficult these days to get dwarf roots, full dwarf, like an M9 rootstock. That would be uh, preferable. But it's a little hard to find them because the commercial people are kind of uh, buying up all the rootstock these days. But at, at the same time, if you have a limited size yard, you really just uh, don't want to th even think about one of those big trees. You can, if you can find some dwarf trees, you can fit a few of these very easily and just about anywhere in your yard. The other thing to keep in mind, you can dwarf a semi-dwarf tree that can be purchased in a nursery nowadays. And if you plant that semi-dwarf and you start pruning on it early and do a little summer pruning, you know, then you can uh, actually dwarf that tree. But you got to be a little careful. You have to know what you're doing in summer pruning so you, so you don't kill your tree. It's just going to be kind of a, a light, like a 10% wood max removal. Yeah, next. <clears throat> so remember that a lot of times uh, pruning is considered fruit thinning and shade reduction. So what I'm saying here is when you prune in the wintertime, you're removing wood, you're removing a lot of, uh, you're thinning the wood out, the canopy out. And so what are you doing when you're thinning all that, taking all that wood out of there? You're thinning the fruit crop. So you've reduced the, dramatically the, the amount of actual fruit thinning you have to do later. So pruning is, to me, is always the first step of fruit thinning. It removes probably 60, 50, 60% 60 of the potential, you know, crop that's coming out. Uh, apples and cherries, or apples and pears, uh, one of the things you have to remember, they produce on spurs. So if you're pruning uh, only one year wood, you're probably not reducing much of a crop. But just remember, pruning apples correctly removes that old wood and spurs, and that does help. So if you're taking those limbs all the way back, like I was saying, and not just tipping them, that does help to open the tree up for better light and it thins the crop. And one of the real uh, uh, interesting things that the wine grape industry developed and understood a long time ago is the quality of your crop, the quality of that fruit, the quality of the potential wine is created through better light. But, and that's absolutely true with the fruit crop, with the uh, apple and cherry. <clears throat> if you're not getting good light into the canopy and throughout the canopy, you won't have high quality fruit. Yeah, next. <clears throat> now, I, I refer to fruit thinning as the forgotten quality step. So this, this technically is not like uh, pruning for the wintertime, but I like to encourage everybody to think about fruit thinning a little bit more because this is what makes your crop nice. This is what really allows your tree to produce a quality piece of fruit without being without having a, a big bunch of apples or pears right together that that really have a lot of insects and disease issues. So next. <clears throat> so why do I thin fruit or why do we why should we thin fruit? Well you can see a lot of lot of reasons, but mostly fruit size, color, the sugars improved. And that's for all of these varieties. And 
Here's, here's another big thing. A return bloom is enhanced. So when you're pruning a fruit tree, you're really, what you're doing is you're thinning the crop. And by thinning the crop, you're improving the bloom for the coming season. And you can add to that by thinning the fruit a little bit uh, more than you otherwise would. And of course, it, it protects your tree and it improves the pest control. So when you're uh, thinning fruit, I always say just, you know, put your hand up there and about a six inch of you extend your little finger and your thumb out. You're, you're getting pretty close, probably to six inches. And that's when I like to leave a distance between an apple, pear, peach, whatever you're talking about on a tree. Next. So some of, some of these might be a little hard to see, but you can kind of see the, a picture like this shows a cluster of apples and it'll have three, four, five, usually odd numbers, but uh, three, four, five fruit in there. And the idea is you absolutely don't wanna leave clusters because your, your limbs are gonna break. So next. So when you're uh, hitting the tree and you wanna be thinning a few things, you're gonna have a big cluster of fruit like this right off of one spur and you're going to leave just one apple there. You don't want to leave a cluster. This, is, this isn't like growing grapes. We're not leaving clusters of fruit here. So just thin one apple or thin everything but one apple. Yep. Next. So when you've thinned your, your tree properly, this is more or less what you want to see. This you'll, You want to see an apple and then a nice spur that has no fruit on it. And then another apple and maybe a nice, uh, another nice spur in here somewhere. And then another apple and behind another branch doing the same thing. And this, what this does is you've got the fruit developing beautifully in this environment, but you also have next year's crop developing, developing beautifully because you've got this spur where you haven't left fruit there and that is differentiating, the buds are differentiating in this year and where the crop year is for next season's crop. If you had left apples on every one of these spots or even a little cluster of every, the tree gets the message that you've overset. And so you really, it, it shuts down and it doesn't make fruit buds for next year. Next. And so this gives you an idea again, this is kind of a, what you, what you say, okay, what am I looking at here? Well, you're looking at lots of little apples that are sitting on the ground. When you get done thinning properly on an apple tree, you're gonna have, like I've said, 90% maybe, maybe more than 90% of the fruit that's set on your tree is gonna be back on the ground. <clears throat> but the fruit that's in your tree is gonna be lovely. It's gonna be good sized, not going to be quite as uh, pest uh, filled and you also won't get nearly as much disease. So next. So if you are thinning, uh, looks like you might have to hit hit some. Yep, there we go. So go ahead and just uh, hit hit a number of them. There's about five or six points here, but Apple, you're thinning uh, within less than 40 days. So let's say your bloom is uh, just arrived. You've got about 40 days maximum to do that thinning of your fruit. And if you wait beyond 40 days, you know, the tree's already getting the signal to don't set as much fruit or make as many fruit buds for next year. So remember, when you're thinning, you leave one fruit for every two spurs. With pears, you've got about 60 days. So if your area blooms in uh, early May or late April, you've, you've got just into the early part of summer before you make sure you gotta get uh, everything, everything uh, thinned. <clears throat> and with cherries, generally speaking, you don't need to thin cherries, but what, uh, what our industry does out here for really high quality cherry uh, uh, crops and to get the good size is they will thin out the old spurs. They'll go in and if you see branches where the spurs are getting really 
uh, close and on top of each other a lot. Uh, when the people are pruning, they'll thin out the spurs so that they've spaced those spurs out about that four or five inches. <clears throat> so just remember, if you're waiting past these timelines to thin, the, the trees aren't going to produce the flower buds for next season. So next. So there are a few uh, say, my goodness, that's a lot of work to get out there and thin all that fruit off of those trees and down to singles. Then you say, absolutely, it is. It is a lot of work. There are chemical thinners. You can uh, buy these at, at your uh, lawn and garden stores. You can get out and buy these thinners, but uh, often they're pretty sensitive to temperature. <clears throat> so if you spray, for example, if you put your thinner out and you mixed it into your sprayer and you've uh, sprayed it out over the crop, and then all of a sudden you get very cold, outbreak for a week or so or very high temperatures for about a week what will happen is the cool conditions will minimize the impact and the and the high temperatures will make the the chemical thin a little more aggressive and drop fruit so so kind of keep those in mind and the the other thing uh, if you've got stressed trees where normally let's say you don't you don't uh, water your trees but it's been really dry and they're stressed out that's going to make the, the drop a little heavier. And then the young, vigorous trees are the ones that really behave pretty well when you put these products out. And, and again, uh, don't, a lot of these uh, will have chemical, well, they'll encourage you that the best time for spraying is right around petal fall. And so what else happens around petal fall? Well, we hopefully the petal fall is almost complete so that there aren't many bees around. So I don't like to encourage anybody to spray anything during bloom. So uh, protect the bees. Uh, next. And this slide would just give you an idea of the names of some of the types of bloomer, bloom spreading products or, or dropping and thinning products. So you've got, for example, uh, post bloom, you know, ethyl, Ethapon and uh, Frutone and Oxamil. So there is another routine that a lot of the orchard people still use, and they mix lime sulfur and fish oil together. And uh, and that does a, actually a pretty good job of thinning fruit, but you have to make sure you're getting the right formula together on those. And a lot of homeowners now, depending on where you live, uh, can't buy a lime sulfur. So that kind of eliminates that from uh, one of our, our products that we can uh, do the thinning. So next. So I'm going to give you just a, a little feedback on apple and cherry pests. Now, my thought here was to just include this mostly so if you can access uh, some of the material later on, uh, so I, I did send a, a, a PDF copy of, of the presentation. And one of the things I want you to think about is uh, pest control. And a lot of the pest control is listed as kind of a, a dormant season pest control. But in fact, there is some that follows through into the spring and summer. And so I thought, well, I'll put down some of the things that I put together for homeowner orchard people around in uh, Oregon and uh, let you go ahead and have a resource too. So next. So a couple of the major pests that you probably have that, that uh, just all apple and pear areas have, and, and that's uh, codling moth. Uh, codling moth, of course, is, uh, is prevalent throughout the whole United States. It was a pretty heavy pressure when I worked at Cornell and and when I lived in Minnesota, I knew that they had a lot of codling moth and out here in California and, and uh, Oregon where I've lived and worked, it's uh, also a, a big pest. So one of the things you have to do is you have to learn to identify them and, and know when they're going to be around. And so nowadays people are using mostly pheromones and you can see by understanding the pheromone, you understand, well, this is the life cycle. 
And so you can get through a lot of the, understand a lot of these, uh, what's happening with these insects. When you think about it in terms of, well, the, the adult comes out in the spring and usually in the latter part of May here in Oregon, you're gonna have the activity of this insect. And so they lay their eggs here, they mate and they lay their eggs on the fruit and it'll be young fruit at the time. And then these tiny little uh, neonate larvae will come out and then the larvae will, will crawl over to an apple and they enter typically at the floral end of the fruit and they come up into the center of the fruit of the apple or pear. And then, and they'll be in there for a number of, uh, a number of instar, you know, they, they go through the fifth instar inside. That's kind of like stages of growth. And when they hit that point, then they tunnel out. So what are you seeing when you see on the outside of the fruit, you'll see a little exit point <clears throat> like we did in that last uh, slide that you're, you're seeing they're exiting, they're feeding their way out. And uh, often you, people think that's where they've entered, but no, that's actually where they've left. And they'll either crawl down the trunk or they'll uh, later, they'll uh, just drop to the ground. And that's where they overwinter. Then the larvae overwinters into a, uh, in the hibernaculum here. So how do you uh, basically work with these guys? You go to the next slide, please. And, and basically you're using the pheromone trap to know when they're around. And the pheromone trap can be had at just about any gardening store nowadays. And what it is, it's like a little tent that you hang, a little cardboard tent that you hang in your tree. And you have a little capsule in it, and it has a chemical in there that is an attractant. And so that attracts these uh, these adults to there, and they get stuck in it. And it's not like you're trying to eliminate them by trapping. What you're trying to do is know when they're around your trees and at what level. And so this is what gives you the idea of when it's proper time to spray. So next. <coughs> So the little attractants are in there that are attracting, there's both attractants that uh, pull females in, and then the chiromone will attract both the male and the female. But you hang these traps in there and you can see they have a little insert that's got a sticky bottom and they get in there. So next. <clears throat> so you can put a lot of different types of traps. Some people like to hang them as high as they can in the trees. And, and I think that's a good practice and kind of on the north side. I, I just say kind of the shadier, the cooler side of the tree is better. And you don't, for most homeowners, one trap is sufficient unless you've got, you know, more, more than a few acres of trees. Uh, one trap would be sufficient. Next. And then um, my kind of goal around here is about the middle of May. I want to get those traps in the trees. And when they when I catch five moths in a, in one week, then I make my first application, and then I clean the trap out after each week, and then I make the next spray whenever I have two moths in a trap. And for homeowners, I've found, generally speaking, that if if you're making a an application of one of the products about once. Uh, once or twice, probably twice on average a month is about right. But even once a month, you're still going to have a pretty good control. Next. <clears throat> so a lot of guys, you might have heard of something called mating disruption. Well, we're, it's just basically they, they flood the whole, the whole orchard with the pheromone. And this only works for commercial orchards, so I'm just going to make a mention of it. But uh, you'd have to have about 10 acre minimum to be able to make it worthwhile to do the mating disruption. Next. And go ahead and, and uh, enter a few times. And so just a reminder that or organic products do does not mean pesticide free. So when you're using any of these products, you know, make sure that you're following the labels very carefully and, and being careful. And next. The one of the things that I like uh, a lot 
is one of these new products called Sidex. It's a granulosis virus and it works very well with apples and pears. It actually works with cherries rather well too. And the, the other thing that I like about this is that it, um, it is non-toxic to any kind of mammal, to your pets, to you, to anybody. So it's a real nice product. Uh, I, what I do also is I always alternate when I'm making applications for controls. So I alternate with another product like uh, spinosad. Uh, in trust is the organic form of spinosad. Uh, next. And then there are a few other things that you can try. There, uh, People have uh, used Bt, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, and and uh, it works on some of the leaf foliage. It's not, it's not so great on the codling moth, but it does work if you have leaf rollers or other insect pest problems. And here's the, here's the virus I was talking about, the granulosis virus for Cydia pulmonella. And then on nematodes, if you, if you try to get the uh, parasitic nematodes, they're the ones that they get pretty active and they can hit the overwintering stage of codling moth pretty good, especially if your soil is still warm in the fall or in the spring. That works well. Next. So another thing that I like to use, the disruption of naturally occurring uh, bio biological controls becomes a secondary. And so I, I really want you to understand that if you're making uh, any kind of a control program for your trees, you know, don't, don't get caught up too much on the broad spectrum uh, heavy hitter products because they do tend to control the codling moth pretty well, but they also then tend to lead to secondary outbreaks. So uh, just a reminder, uh, next. And if you're, if you're having earwig problems, uh, this is ridiculously easy. You, you just get these corrugated pieces of corrugated uh, cardboard and you roll them up. They're the ones that you can see that a little harder to see here, but they, they have uh, openings that the uh, earwigs can crawl down into in the evening. And so you just you just tie these to the trunk of the tree and they'll get in there and yeah, once a day, you just come out and shake those out to either in your chicken yard where the chickens can get them or, or just stomp them somewhere. Next. And if you were working, well, let's go beyond this one. We're not really into parasilla. Go ahead, next. Uh, one more, you go ahead. The pear, pears aren't a big crop apparently in your area, but uh, if you ever get these symptoms, the pear rust mite, uh, you know, you, uh, I've got in the presentation, you'll be able to see what I've recommended. Uh, next. Uh, go ahead. Again, mites, not a big deal. Now, voles are uh, something that you really get a lot of in any orchard and environment if you aren't keeping the ground real clean around your trees. So make sure you keep about a five foot uh, circle around the trees pretty clean. And you can have compost there, et cetera, and even some mulchy material, but no, not a lot of green. The voles will get in there and you can see how they've kind of uh, eaten away a lot of the bark and they'll girdle your trees. So next. And uh, yeah, basically go ahead, next. And the main diseases here, I, again, this is just kind of for you to review and you get your own time. Uh, and you can look at uh, the copy of presentation I sent along. But apple scab is going to be your primary issue probably. You probably get some fire blight in your area because you get, uh, I'm sure, spring freezes from time to time. So anytime you damage the tissue on these uh, limbs of apples and pears, a fire blight bacterium can enter into where the frost has damaged the tissues. And the other way is the when the trees flower, uh, bees then will carry an exudate from the bacterial blight or the bacterial uh, ooze that comes out of fire blight. The bees will carry that over to the flowers of new trees that aren't infected and they'll get in there. Okay, next. 
another disease that uh, is pretty common uh, is shot hole fungus in in pears, apples, uh, even in the stone fruit. Next. And uh, here again with the cherries, as with the last slide, uh, this is another one that can hit cherries pretty hard is the brown rot. So again, you don't, if you've had issues in the past and you don't clean your orchard very well, you don't pick up the dropped fruit, you don't spray fungicides at all, you, you're probably going to have some brown rot. So this is a sanitation issue. So the more sanit the better job you do with sanitation, the less inoculum will be around. But again, maybe one when the fruit is just starting to color and, and get somewhat close to being ripe, like within a week or two, uh, a fungicide treatment usually helps well. Yep, next. And here's the, the pseudomonas blight, the bacterial blight, and it'll cause dieback with your cherry trees. You'll get the fruit buds will get infected. And again, this, this one can uh, happen due to uh, frost and freezes. And, uh, and then the bees will move it around. The ooze that comes out after the disease enters, the bees will move them around to the flowers. And then you'll see the withering flowers. And, and these, you, if you do have a frost or a freeze and you spray a, ba a, a bactericide, something like copper, it will help prevent. Or if you've had that, uh, oh, uh, any other kind of a disease issue in the past, the copper will try to help resolve these issues. It does a pretty good job. Next. And I always encourage people to do a lot of IPM scouting. In other words, you know, have out, this is an apple maggot trap. And just, just on a weekly basis, you know, visit your trees, look at them carefully. Next. And and really the, the key here is sanitation when you're working with, with all of your these particular tree crops. And you're removing all the fruit on the ground before winter or hanging in the tree, cutting out cankers, uh, raking up leaves. You know, and if you say, well, gosh, I got, an acre of trees, I'll get your lawnmower out and just to shred those leaves. That's a good thing to do. That that will uh, reduce the inoculum. And always train for good air movement and use those resistant varieties. Okay, next. <clears throat> now, now you can we can just pop through these. These I just put at the end of the presentation because I want uh, each of you to understand there is a you can have a program and think about controlling your pest issues and disease issues, uh, not only through your pruning and your winter dormant season, but, but also in the growing season. You'll have some products that you'll probably need at some point. So I just put on uh, a few simple uh, kind of pest control programs. So let's just go through them real quickly. Go ahead next to the pest control here. So in the summer, you can see for coddling moth, you've got options. Uh, spinosad, surround, sidex, hort oil. Next. And you've got with cherries, you've got these pests that you're dealing with, a bacterial canker or a blossom blight. So bacterial canker, make sure you're pruning in, in as dry a season as you can. If your fall back there is the driest season, do some pruning there. If, if it's better to wait till uh, winter, do the pruning there. But basically, when you're doing the pruning in a drier season and using copper, you're going to have much less bacterial canker. And then down here, blossom blight, brown bright, rot again. These are the steps to take to prevent that. Uh, next. And I think probably you're, one of your partners here in, in trying to keep your disease issues and pest issues under control is a good backpack sprayer, especially now if you have one or two trees, of course, it doesn't make much sense. You can use a small one, but but if you're having to do ladder work and the, the safest thing you can possibly do is to have a backpack okay, so that you've got your hands, at least one hand free when you're climbing up 
you know, in the ladder to do work or spraying in the in there. So so use the backpack sprayers. They're much safer than trying to carry a, a little two gallon pump up and hold one that in one hand and hold the, the wand in the other and and you're up on a six foot ladder. Ah, not too safe. Next. And uh, I, I want everybody that does get into trying to have good fruit and, and use a spray program, I want you to understand these two terms. One is re-entry interval. And when you're looking at the labels, this is how long after you've sprayed, this is how long you have to wait before you go back in the orchard. And then the pre-harvest interval is you can apply these products up to you know, within seven days, for example, of harvest. Uh, seven is within three days. Sidex is non-toxic, uh, hoard oil non-toxic, but you can see uh, like immunox of fungicide or sulfur, they all have their different PHI. So know your products, read your labels, know, know them well. Next. And all of these products, of course, have the potential to hurt our uh, honeybee population. So also know what the potential bee hazard is there of each of the products you might use in the home. So the surround clay has none and sulfur doesn't have any, Sidex doesn't have any, but even the organically registered spinosad uh, mineral oil has some, and then some, something like malathion and seven uh, have uh, definitely more uh, potential hazard. So know, know your products and uh, help help to take care of the pollinators. Next. And I think that was, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I would like to actually invite Carol back onto the screen because I know she had popped a couple questions in the chat herself. And so mm -hmm. Carol, I didn't know if you wanted to ask Steve um, kind of in person what questions you had. I do think Steve answered quite a few of those questions as he was talking because, you know, we in the orchard, we actually have seen that we've done a lot of things wrong by listening to Steve today. We set our, um, our, um, how we pruned correctly. And so um, a number of things that I wish we would have done different. We do have one row of trees that we're getting new this year. And so we'll start with those working well. But let's kind of go back. Uh, there was one question about the spacers that you had to make the limbs come out. Would you talk a little bit more about those and what kinds of things can we use to make mm -hmm. them? Okay. The the limb spreaders, as I refer to them, are can be basically you make them at home out of scrap wood. And I, I like, I've found over the years that a piece of scrap wood that's about two inches wide and then I'll cut various lengths, any, anything from, from one foot to probably as many as even three and four feet long. And, and then I put a little V notch at the end. So that little V notch, like your finger, let's say, that, that holds up against the branch real nicely. And, and so those spreaders, are extremely important in training because it's uh, an easy way to hold that limb in place in the position you want it to develop. And without having to, a lot of people like to use the strings and tie them down and put stakes in and things, but that's rather inconvenient for those of us that have to mow and, and work around the tree and cultivate, etc. cetera. So, so the little, those little wood spreaders just find a bunch of scrap wood and, and cut strips. And if one of the master gardeners has a table saw, you know, just start cutting a whole bunch of those and uh, and make little V notches. And there's no correct, one correct length. Uh, you're, you want a variety because each of your trees is gonna be a little different. And as you go up the tree, the, the limbs aren't quite as long as you go up the tree. So usually the, sh the spreaders you're using up on the top of the tree will be a little shorter than the ones in the bottom. So when that is on the tree trunk, do you ever have problems with it rubbing the bark and putting mm -hmm. some problems that way? No, no, I haven't had any issues with it rubbing the bark. It, uh, in, your, in your climate back there versus ours, I can think of one thing that might be a little troublesome is snow. 
you know, where you, you guys would get snow and ice and accumulating and it, it might cause a little extra weight or the wind back there might be a little stronger so it would knock, knock the uh, spreaders out of the tree. And so you might have to be doing a little a little maintenance, walking around and putting more of those back. But but uh, frankly, I've I've never had any damage to the tree. And they like I say, they do fall out of the tree once in a while with a big wind. But that's not a particular issue. We had tried something to do with spreaders um, by hanging a little weight at the end mm -hmm. of the tree, but yeah. definitely rubbed when that weight would go in the uh, wind, that would yeah, yeah. And actually take the bark off. So that didn't work very well for us. I don't, yeah, and I don't like tying the limbs down too much. I, I You noticed I had one limb tied down in one of my pictures, but I don't like it too much because it, it that does tend to rub the, the bark, especially when the limbs are kind of young. It, it can girdle the tree. Um, so one of the um, times when you're talking about cherry trees and you're talking about tipping it back, how uh -huh. far do you do that? Yeah, when you're, I, I had a picture that I was going to include on it. And then the more I looked at that picture, I said, they aren't going to be able <laughs> to see the detail that I'm talking about. So uh, in general, any that you can be working in the lower canopy of the tree, the mid canopy or the upper and any time that you notice that a limb is getting to the point where it doesn't have many side branches and and or much fruit anymore, I start tipping. I cut the tips back and I might only cut back a, a foot on some of these three foot branches. And and then you'll get a lot of little side buds that will break. And so you're doing just the opposite that you want to do with your apple and pear trees. You're, you're tipping these to create more density, more side branching. And so once in a while, you might have to thin some of those out if it seems like you're getting too many. But in general, that's the way to keep the fruiting zone down in the lower canopy of the tree. If, if you allow that tree just to have that permanent shape, and then you always held it like you do with your apple and pear, within about four or five years, you you would have all the fruit up in the upper third of the canopy. The lower part of the tree really wouldn't have much fruit left in it. And it's mostly just the nature of the way that the cherry tree grows. So the other thing you talked about when you talked about trimming old trees is you talked about not taking a large branch out. What if a storm comes and takes that branch out so you do need to cut it? How do you make sure that that isn't a problem later? Mm -hmm. So, so when you're, if you've got a, a large limb that's been damaged, you have to, of course, you're, you're going to go back probably to the trunk, you know, to remove it. It, most of the time, it doesn't make too much sense to, if it's split or torn, something like that, to try to repair it. It's better to remove it. But if what you did is you lost the, the upper reach of that branch and you still had a pretty good uh, intact piece that was maybe half of the limb, you, you might be able to just cut it off at that point and then retrain another uh, new little shoot to be the outward growing leader. But, uh, but in general, uh, the only thing you can do if you've lost, let's say, a major portion of your canopy and you've lost one side due to a big limb being broken off, you you really have to rebalance the tree. And so if you think that when you're rebalancing, you're going to have to cut something off the other side. And by the time you do that, you look at the tree and you say, wow, it's really weird shaped or it's really, you know, awkward. You're probably best off just to remove the tree and to start over. You know, I, I've noticed so many growers in our area that will come in with old orchards or old vineyards and they kind of get caught up in the, the idea that, oh, these older varieties are so unique and so different and all that. And, and they'll work for years to reinvigorate them. And, and then I always ask them, said, so what do you have? You've got a reinvigorated old orchard that's still full of disease and insects and pests. And I said, in general, I, I said, most of the time, I think I would start over. 
And and uh, there might be a rare occasion if you've got a real unique variety that nobody else knows of or has, you might try to save that old tree. But I've got the same thing in my yard. I had an old pear tree that was probably 40, 50 years old. And, and I've been working with it for literally 20 years. I've lived where I'm at now. And what do I have? I've got this <laughs> old, old pear tree and and it still doesn't produce very well and it's got other issues and and i thought i should have started 20 years ago you know just a new tree there i'd have a, this beautiful productive new tree so uh, another question that we have is at our community orchard we have run one row of apples that just don't taste very good and people will pick them and then they don't want them so we want to take that row out when we take an apple tree out and we plant a new apple tree, do we need to make sure and not put it in the same spot the old one was? And how far down do you dig to take that apple tree out? Do you um, do you know if if the trees you're talking about it's just the the variety and the flavor? You, you don't know that you have any disease or pest issues. There is no disease or pest issues on yeah. them. No, I really you them. know. Yeah, frankly, what I would do, uh, if, especially if you've got a, a little bit of time, uh, the recommended uh, issue for people that are going to replant the same fruit tree, the same variety, well, not variety, the same, um, uh, what do you say, family or clone uh, in the area is, is basically to give it one year rest you know, pull, take the tree out as much as you can. I don't know if you can guys have the means to dig out or yank out the roots at all. But if you can get the roots out, that's a pretty helpful thing. Uh, and if if you can put uh, the new planting in the centers of where the spaces were before, you, you probably will get a little bit of a better start for your trees, a little healthier start. But it's not it's not really necessary if your trees, if you didn't notice anything, you know, really going on, anything negative. So if it becomes an issue, I wouldn't hesitate to grow or to uh, replant. But for that first year, uh, there are a lot of uh, cover crops that you can plant that that help to uh, suppress any kind of organisms that are in the soil. And so you could you could plant something like a, a mu mustard cover crop, or a um, trying to remember what the other one is a barley. Barley and mustard are are often considered to be good kind of uh, rotational crops that uh, help. They don't they don't kill anything, but they kind of suppress. They they exude chemicals into the soil. Both of them that suppress things like nematodes and a few other issues. So, so that would be helpful. All right, Caitlin, I do see that we've got other questions. Yes, there is one. Is tip pruning done on Nanking cherries? Oh, absolutely. You can do the tip pruning on any, any kind of cherry. The, those trees will all uh, do a lot better job of making new shoots and fruiting zone shoots. So, yep, now that can be done on those too. All right, we did have somebody ask if they could send you a picture of a cherry tree, if you would help them with that. Is that mm -hmm. something that you can help us with? We wouldn't uh, give you lots, but we had one request. <laughs> they have, is it a disease or something, you know, or a health issue? I think it was help on pruning on health. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. All right, we've taken a lot of time and we went way over our hour, but we have enjoyed having you with us, Steve. Yeah, well, yeah. that was mostly my problem, I think, or my fault. I think. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, before we go, I just want to remind everyone to go ahead and fill out the evaluation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for folks that might be new to the sessions, um, just to show you where you can find those evaluations. So on the Soothing Garden Show website, if you're watching there, you can go underneath the speakers tab. And if you go down to Steve's session, you click on that, we'll be able to find uh, the evaluation link. If you're watching on Facebook, you'll be able to find the evaluation direct link uh, to the site. So it's right here in the blue. If you click where it says evaluation link, it will take you directly over there. 
Um, and we really do value uh, your feedback. We're very interested to see how everybody's been liking um, our virtual Sioux Lane Garden Show. And then just a reminder, go ahead and look up all the other sessions that we have coming up the next uh, three weeks. Um, so every uh, Friday at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Central Time, uh, we hope that you all can join us. And thank you so much, Steve, for joining us. And we hope to see everyone yeah. next week for the rest of our sessions. If anybody wants to practice this weekend, we'll be out at the orchard. Come and join us in the afternoons on either Saturday or Sunday. Yep, get to it. You know, it's